When we're young, we have an amazing, positive outlook about how great life is going to be, but somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Yes. Hello there, world. This is episode 131 of Join Up Dot, the daily motivational conversational chat, which brings the ziggers and the zaggers of the world into one place. And we've got a lady today who is, it's a fascinating story. I, I love this show. When when I started it, sort of over 100 and whatever episodes ago it was, I kind of had this idea of what I wanted to achieve. Once I got into about 30, 40 shows, I started looking around at other people shows and I started seeing the same names appearing and so I consciously went in a different direction to bring you the kind of guys that in many cases and the ladies are shy and don't really like doing this kind of thing but they have got a towel which is actually purely inspirational and today's guest really falls into that camp. She was born in South Africa and spent her childhood enjoying the amazing wildlife of the continent so I suppose it's not a surprise really but her life has stayed close to nature and since 2004, she's held the position of Director of the Wilderness Foundation, developing ways that we can link wilderness trails to peace and reconciliation. But her connection with the foundation actually goes back a lot further to 1998. Now, she believes that the effects of protecting the wilderness is a great way of developing sound youth leadership built on environmental awareness and ethics, especially the youths that might be considered as at risk. Now, if you take kids who might have lost their morals, their focus, or perhaps a belief that the world is a wonderful place and get them to challenge their attention into protecting and establishing the world, it seems to me a fantastic way to bring the lost souls back to us in a hugely positive way and is something we need more and more of across the globe. But let's find out where she channels her efforts on a daily basis and whether this lady who is spending her time providing such value to the world is actually content with her efforts or like so many wonderfully caring people, does she beat herself up that she isn't doing as much as she would want for the world? And lastly, I suppose, could she imagine any other life or was it destined from her very first days on the earth? Well, let's find out as we bring on to the show to start joining up dots, the one and only Joe Roberts. How are you, Joe? Oh, good. Thank you, David. Thank you for a great write-up. Did, did, I, did I do justice to you? Because it seems to me that you have got so much on your plate just that I was speaking to you a moment ago and you've flown in from Canada and most people would then go to bed for a few hours, but you went straight to work, which kind of sounds like madness to me. But is that the kind of nuts and bolts of what Joe Roberts is about? I, I guess so. I, I guess so. I think that life is an extremely exciting, wonderful thing. Um, and I try and pack it in. And everybody will say to me, you are completely insane, woman, because I think... Life is so full of experience and so full of opportunity um, that I don't want to miss out. So I'm, I'm called the FOMO, the fear of missing out person. So uh, I make good use of my life, let's put it that way. I've never heard that. So that's a FOMO, the fear of missing out. Yes, and that, that, that was obviously a young person who taught me that. So it's quite funny. Uh, is your vocabulary, because you spend a lot of time with youngsters, do you actually find yourself using different words that other people of a similar age, and I'm being very polite how I'm saying this, don't actually use? Because I'm surrounded by kids on a daily basis, and half the time I can't understand a word they're saying now. It's like this new language that I've created, which I think especially for old fogies like me, so they can talk in front of me and I haven't got an idea. Are, are you clued up on this kind of vocab that they use? Um, well, I've got to be really careful that I don't try and sound like a teenager at 54, but I do say awesome a lot, which I get told off about by my children. I do say, um, they're, they're the odd things that I, I do say that, in fact, none of the young people I work with pick me up on, but my children go, mommy, you can't say that, that's just awful. Um, I think that, sadly, a lot of the kids I work with probably have the most expletive vocabulary that you've ever heard. And I really try and role model not swearing. So it kind of, um, that's one of the things I don't pick up. But I do say awesome um, an awful lot. Well, that, that, that's, that's, that's all right, life. isn't it? I, but that's sums up life. 
So I think life is awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. I can kind of get away. But the funny things that being a South African clash, um, when I was growing up in South Africa, if you cotched, it meant you were violently sick. Whereas English kids talk about having a coaching time, which means they're chilling. So, so you've got to learn fast. I've never heard that one. Coaching time. Yeah, cut, yeah no, we, had, we, were, we were really coaching. So if you were South African, you'd think they were throwing up violently behind a bush. But actually, they're just having a chill time. I always wonder who has created this language and how people know about it. It's like, it's like when I'm at a football uh, a match and suddenly 5,000 people suddenly start singing this song at exactly the same time that I've never heard of. And I think to myself, how have they got together and learnt this? Do they have like evening classes secretly where they go and do these kind of things? Because there seems to be this kind of a movement that happens around me. And as, as you say, catching. I think, well, OK, one person's made that up, but how do so many people get to know it? I know. It's, it's, if only we could find that little secret, David, we could, we could do the best marketing job on the planet. No, I don't know quite how it works, but it, it's very funny. It is very funny. So, so let's take you back in time. You are obviously not in South Africa at the moment. Give, give us an indication of where you are before we do take you back in time. Right. So I um, am based in Essex. Um, and, you know, that was by fluke because of my husband's job. It wasn't somewhere that we said, oh, we really, really want to live in Essex, UK. It was, again, one of the dots of life that just happened. Um, I am sitting in my office, um, and I am so blessed and so lucky because we um, are on a 400-acre farm and nature site. So looking out of my window, I'm looking at um, farm vehicles, and barns and a beautiful walnut tree and we've got a lovely visitor center just next to us where we've got four young people doing employment um, training and making bush fires and camp craft and stuff and so i'm very blessed so i'm, I'm about um 25 minutes from stansted airport which a lot of people know in the countryside outside of chelmsford as a main town i used to live in chelmsford did you? Oh. I, I spent a few years in Chelmsford. I'm this. You are actually the closest interview I've ever done. I'm I'm in Essex at the moment. Where are you? I'm about. Well, did you know Canvey Island? Yes. I'm just outside Canvey Island. Um, sort of like five miles away from South End on Sea, just on the River Thames. Wow. Well, that's great. Well, you're very close to a lot of areas we work with young people from. We work with a lot of youngsters from South End. So yeah, that's really interesting. And so we're, we're um, between Chelmsford and Braintree in the countryside. Give, give us the name so I can really pick Chatham, Chatham Green. So the, the, the site is a small village called Chatham Green. And we're on a beautiful, um, where farmers have diversified. This farmer, which is Strata and Parker Farms, which is one of the biggest grain producers in the country, um, have renovated old farm buildings. And so we're in a beautiful sort of converted barn um on, a, on a, the most beautiful place and uh, so we're very blessed we've got skylarks singing and meadows and crops and it's just beautiful very lucky well what i like about you already joe is that you seem blessed at, on the simple things of life the kind of things that we would just walk past you seem to focus in on those you know the sort of the natural world is that because of your childhood growing up in South Africa where you you obviously were surrounded by quite amazing wildlife has that simple approach to what is beautiful in the world come from there do you know I, I, I think so I I think that I was born lucky because I think I see beauty in small things and um, I think I see the world in natural beauty so wherever I am whatever I'm doing I'm always going oh my god that's so beautiful and that could be just the sunlight falling on leaves that make them glow or it it could be a bird flying over my head and I think maybe um, it came from my dad who is a great philanthropist naturalist and so I always grew up almost being quite meditative about nature. So you would look at something and be completely mindful with it and totally absorbed by it. But I also love people immensely. So I think I kind of get the pleasure from, from the good things in people and the good things in, in what the world brings us. 
when, think... when you look back to yourself in uh, South Africa, can you remember when you were first aware of the sort of the enormity of the area? Because I, I kind of grew up in Essex, as we're in Essex now, and you have pockets of countryside. And actually, when you fly over this county, you realise it's a lot greener than you imagine. When you're in a car, you sort of go from town to town to town, and you think it's quite built up. But being in Africa, that's totally a different way, isn't it? it? There's hardly any roads in certain areas, and it's just wilderness, wilderness, wilderness. Were you aware of that kind of vast expanse, or was it just something that you naturally thought happened all, o- all across the globe? I don't really know. I mean, I think I grew up in Johannesburg in a very sort of ordinary suburb um, with a big garden as a child. And, I, you know, I know I'm sort of digressing slightly, but I remember thinking our garden was about a thousand acres. And obviously, when you grow up and you go back, you realize your garden's only maybe a quarter of an acre. So I think as a child, you see the world as very big and everything is much larger than when, than you see it when you're an adult. But I think I was very lucky because my dad, we camped a lot. So we would leave Johannesburg very regularly on weekends and um, and go up to the bush um, where we would camp and bird watch and do walks. And so I think I just, it was my reality. Um, I don't think I knew anything different. And then the first time I ever left South Africa to go overseas because my father's Danish was when I was 14 and we went abroad. But I still don't think I was kind of aware of it. I think it's only awareness comes later and perspective comes later. I think at the time it is just what it is and you don't know any different really. Did, did your love of nature then come from your dad? It seems that he was hugely inspirational in your life, taking you camping and, and doing that kind of thing as a young girl. Yeah, no, I think I was like a complete little shadow. So, you know, I really followed my father around like a little kind of um, hungry lamb. And um, he was a very inspiring person. He still is. I mean, he's just 90 um, ne- this month, and he's actually arriving next week for his 90th birthday. Um, I, I think that I think he was an inspiring person, and I just I think I was a very lonely child in some ways, but I kind of completely lapped up his his knowledge and attention, and I just completely absorbed him like a little sponge, um, and that was a great. That was a great gift to have a father like that was pretty inspiring. I, I think that's an amazing gift. And I think that's one of the things why you seem to be such a, a nurturing person for the youth of today who are kind of lost in many ways and haven't got that parent to, to really support them and, and hold their hands and show them the right ways of doing it. Is, is that just me thinking off the top of my head or do you think there's any sort of elements of truth to that? Do you know, I, I just feel I want to share and that's why I do what I do. I think that I feel I was so privileged and I was very privileged as a white South African and I think that stays very heavily in my in my psyche. But I think I have been given tastes of life that I want to share. I don't I don't want to hold it for myself. And so I think I try and share what I've got with others. Um I kind of think I was very 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 lucky. And um, so when I sit on the edge of a mountain with a young person and we are looking across at wildness or we're looking across at the sun setting and it's beautiful and I can feel that in some way I've helped them to be able to have that experience, then that is what makes life really meaningful Um, because not a lot of other people would sit on top of a mountain with them and just sit in silence or or go, go, isn't that awesome? Um, so it's a sharing. I think I want to be able to share what I've been lucky enough to have. That's what motivates me. And, and do kids, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the ones that have turned around, because I imagine doing a program like you're doing, not all kids turn around, but do, do you have some kids that will sit there and go, oh, this is boring? this is boring and whatever you show them and whatever kind of experiences you try to offer them or paths that you sort of develop for them they they don't embrace it at all yeah that happens um but i think that we're very careful um i think we intuitively and instinctively meet young people who 
somehow want to take a step with us. I don't know what it is. I think we we mag- we we have some magnetic pull that they kind of want to do something. Maybe it's the excitement of life that we present to them. But I think that we have a pretty good success rate. But, you know, it's back to our discussion about success. What is success? And what is successful for one person is not successful for another. And so we have to be terribly careful when we're working with a range of human beings about being able to measure what success is for them um, rather than a blanket of what success means for the world. Um, and I think that every one of our young children that we work with, our young people, is are successful in something. But one of our measures is how many of them will go on to do further education or employment. I'm really keen on people sustaining themselves, being able to, to earn enough to, to live a life of meaning for them that they can cope and manage. And I'd say that on the whole, a lot of them do very well in that. Um, and it might not be what the next person would choose. It might be doing bar work, it's working in Tesco's, it's maybe studying more. Um, but but they do okay. They and, and that's that's finding their own level of success. And that's what, what I sometimes need to watch is I you know, I was brought up with a very strong work ethic and a very strong ethic of intellectual development, which came a lot from my historical background. And I have to watch myself that that's not what I'm sort of nurturing and nudging people towards, um, because that's my reality. The the fascinating thing on on that statement that you were making was that the kids kind of find you at the right time. But that's, that's interesting, isn't it? That it's something that's you can't really put into words how these kids kind of find that first step towards you, but it happens. Yeah, it does. I mean, I would say that, you know, we've been running our turnaround program for 16 to 21 year olds since 2007. Um, and I think we have maybe had one child who's actually pulled out of the program in all that time. So, they, our young people stick with us and we, we stick with them. So it works both ways. We, we don't give up. And um, if something goes wrong, we bounce back and we come back and we say, this is life. Life knocks you back, but what can we do about it? How can we, we repair that and keep going? Um, we're very much around resilience and building um, strength from knowing that because you've had an argument or something hasn't worked out, it doesn't mean that you stop. And I think for a lot of young people, and I think this is kind of what what is happening across the world as a whole, is I think we've lost tenacity as a human trait. We're not very tenacious anymore. Um, And people give up very quickly if there's a pain element to it. And I'm really interested in how do we move through pain and how do we come out the other side, having learned and benefited, um, but that it doesn't mean we stop um, completely. And I mean, in the body, pain is to say, stop, something's not working. And I think that's the same in humans. Pain is to say, stop, something's not working. But it doesn't mean that you don't keep moving forward. You keep moving forward, but doing things differently. I, I agree with that totally, and I think one of the problems that we've got in the world today kind of links down to the, I suppose it's the, the glamorous X Factor or the American Idol thing, where kids and, and adults almost buy into this myth that you only need to sing a couple of songs and then suddenly you're playing Madison Square Garden. But success and sort of drive, a- anyone who's who's got to anywhere, it's not a straight line, is it? But I think so many people now think that it is... A to B to C to D to E, and then you are where you are, but you're not. You're sort of moving around and you're trying different things and that doesn't quite work, so you try something else. It's it's the overriding passion that you need to have to kind of get to where you want. And if you hit a closed door, you'll try another door and another door and another door, and then you'll get through that one and then you'll move on a bit. And it's just that, is it tenacity or is it that desire for, I suppose, overnight success, Joe? I think I think you're absolutely right. I think we've become very short framed. I think we think that with a little we'll get a lot. And I think life isn't really like that. I think life is I always say one of my boring statements, and I'm sure if you spoke to our young people, they'd say, Oh God, that's a Joe statement. 
you know, I believe what you put into life is what you get out of it. And if you're putting effort in, you don't always get the result you expect, but something will come out of that. Um, so there's kind of quite a strong philosophy, I think, that you you do you do need to put put the work in um, if you really want to get an outcome that's of value to you. Um, and I think that you're right. I think we've become very short termism and very minimal input because a lot of stuff doesn't take a lot of striving. Um, and I think young people do are pulled in a direction of a celebrity culture, which I think is a really sad thing um, because it's based not always on the greatest of values. Um, and I'm a great person around values and trying to really understand what what are good values? What what values do we need in this world to make us live well together and to respect each other and to care for each other? So, I, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think we, we've become very short-termism and we're not prepared to put the effort in. I'm, I'm just going to play a little speech now, and this is from an American comedian that we all know called Jim Carrey, but it's been sort of going viral on the internet, so I like to throw this on the show because it, we always get this point on, in the conversation that, this just is a natural dovetail fit. So have a listen to this and see what you think about this. My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. Is that a message that we should be teaching in schools? Absolutely. I think that we're very frightened of failure. And I think that failure is probably our biggest gift. And I think it's the things that we fail at that we learn the most from. And, and I remember we had a patron um, called Norman Vaughan, and he was... Um, at 93, he was the last survivor of the Admiral Byrd expedition to the South Pole. And he gave me his book and um, in the front he'd, he'd, he'd inscribed it, it said, Dare to Fail. Um, and I think that is the most beautiful quote of Jim Carrey's. I'm going to kind of put that above my desk. It is beautiful and it's absolutely spot on um, because he's right. You can fail at doing all the stuff that you didn't really want to do, but take the risk. I, I think that there's something very powerful about risk um, because without risk, we never grow. Um, and, and I, you know, watch parents say to children, oh, don't climb that rock, you might fall. Don't do this, you might, this might happen to you. And I think the Native Americans have a wonderful philosophy, which we use with our programs called the Circle of Courage. And that's how they raised their kids. And, and one of the things that they talked about was you needed children to learn and fail before they learned, that before they grew. So they would watch a, a small child um, struggle to open a door and they wouldn't rush up to open the door for the child. They'd let them go through that learning experience um, because that's how they developed their skill set. Um, and I think we, we, and I hate to damn our, our kind of ways of living because they're really good stuff. But I think one of the things we, we do too much because we want to make it easy for our children. And actually our children need to have it not so easy so they learn and grow it's, and strengthen. It's like, you know, plants grow strong when the wind blows on them. They learn to adapt and grow and be strong. They strengthen themselves. And, and you don't want to stop the wind blowing. Um, so you've got to learn to grow and strengthen um, so you can cope when the wind blows. I, I think that's true as well. I was, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about my own kids and my younger kids are, what, 12 and 9, um, a girl and a boy. And last night I was teaching them to make spaghetti bolognese. And are they going to be making it tomorrow on their own? No, they're not. But I've got this vibe that they've got to, if I suddenly die, are they going to be able to survive? And hopefully they will now be able to survive on crisps and spaghetti bolognese. And so I've kind of done my job in that regard but yeah the, the, the easiness really struck home the other day when my daughter came back from sports day with like this medal and I said to her oh you won then she went no I went well, well what's the medal for oh just for taking part and I thought that's rubbish isn't it that's rubbish everyone gets a medal so how do you define the winners to the losers and I know it's not nice to lose but you've got to lose haven't you because then there's no achievement 
But I think life is life has always got some element of competition in it, and one's got to learn. It's one's got to learn. You've got to learn from the defeat as well as from the success. And I agree with you. I I don't think one should just get medals just for the sake of it. I think life is going to throw competition and success and failure at our kids when we're not there to shield them. And they've got to learn to deal with it. And and funny enough, we've got one of our young lads from our program here who I just am celebrating his ability to cope with being knocked back because we did a big expedition up into the Pyrenees and um, his passport just did not arrive. They'd promised it on the by the Friday before we left and it never turned up. And he got left behind. And the, the nobility and the uh, ability of this young boy who'd never traveled abroad, he'd never been on an airplane, this trip was so massive for him. He held it with such dignity um, and then supported all the others when they got back by listening to all their stories patiently and sweetly. That, to me, is just real um, ability to, to, to cope with a throwback um, and says so much about him as a person. And I have a firm philosophy that we we actually are animals. We might like to not think that we are, but we are actual animals. And animals raise their children to survive. That's what animals do. You, you nudge your little wobbly kneed lamb up so its legs strengthen. So if, if danger comes, they can run. And, uh, and I think that's what we need to do with our children is to love them and nurture them. But to actually get their legs strong so they can run. And and we forget that. The more civilized we think we are, the more we grow away from the very things that keep us safe and 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 enable us to be resilient and strong. Now, now that that kid, he, he's going to do all right for himself, isn't he? If if he's got how how old is he? The one who's um, he was 16. Such... He was 16 at the time. And um, he is a beautiful, beautiful young young man. And that level of value system is something he will carry with him forever. Um, and we were just so proud of um, his ability to take a knock like that and not be nasty and not to be um, sorry for himself and not to uh, be resentful towards the others for the experience that they had. This lad really role modeled a, a really good set of values and and personal strength that i think was phenomenal absolutely phenomenal have to sing his praises all the time he was beautiful well absolutely should we give him a, a name check on the show yes what does that mean give him his name yeah let, let, let the world know this person's name so that we okay. in 10 years um, time when he's suddenly doing amazing things which he's already doing people will go i remember that boy's name uh, this young man is called Brennan Norris and he's from Braintree and I think he's a very courageous very special young man well I, I would like to be able to connect with him afterwards if, if that would be all right because absolutely and I, I he's, was... here, he's here today doing doing his employability course and uh, I will definitely connect you with him David he's a very special person yeah and I'll send him a nice little email and a little voicemail and um, I'll tell him how proud I am of him as Thank well you. Thank you. No, that's. I think that's beautiful. Normally, we're very um, protective of our young people's information, but I think with their success and uh, worthy of praise, let's just get it out there. I love that. Thank you. No, that's absolutely okay, and that's good for me as well. So, so how does it work then? We, we've kind of touched on what you're achieving, but how how did this idea come first of all? What was it something that? the Wilderness Foundation grew around or what did the Wilderness Foundation come first and then think, right, what should we do with ourselves? Um, okay, I'm going to have to summarise what could take hours because I can talk for Africa. How am I going to say this? Okay, so there was, uh, a, there is a very um, wonderful conservationist called Ian Player who I sort of grew up with in the background um, as a child. He was my father's age. Um, and he was a very prominent conservationist in South Africa, and he founded um, several wilderness organizations. And he was passionate about wilderness. Um, and I'd grown up very passionate about the outdoors and nature. And um, I picked up a book of his uh, when I, we were living in Luxembourg for a long time. And I picked up a book of his uh, called Shadow and Soul um, and read this book with great interest. And it was really around the spiritual value of wilderness. 
and and I've grown up in a very pragmatic sort of game rangery way around wilderness um, and nature and I was brought up very much by my dad to sort of everything had a name and I understood all the names of birds and I I didn't actually know much about the spirit of wilderness and through reading this book, it exposed and brought me to a much deeper connection around why wilderness has such a spiritual connection for people. And I'd also was then moving from Luxembourg back to England, and I'd read an article about a project of taking young kids from the townships back into the game reserves. Just very briefly, for those who don't know it, as a South African in the apartheid years, black South Africans didn't go to game reserves. Only white people went to game reserves. And in fact, my father fought for the first camp for black South Africans to be able to stay in a game reserve in the Kruger National Park. And um, this project to me made ticked all my boxes because it was taking urban youth who had been disconnected from what is their ecological heritage, their birthright of wild nature, and it reconnected them by taking them back into the parks with retired game rangers, black and black game rangers. Um, and built pride and love for nature. And so I then wrote to the Wilderness Foundation and said uh, I wanted to raise money, to, to raise more money, to put more kids onto the programs. And that's how, when I came back from Luxembourg, I got involved with the Wilderness Foundation and started to grow a project um, funding here called Mbewu, which means the seed in Zulu. So it means you plant a seed which grows. And we've now got the same project running in Scotland. Um, called in Bay with Scotland and taking urban kids from Glasgow and Edinburgh from inner cities back out into nature meeting intergener intergenerationally with people who live on the land and who can share their love of it um, but that's how I got involved in, in the early days in 1998 was around raising money to get young black kids back out into game reserves and and what was it a need or was it just a passion for you? Did you being out there? Did you kind of think no, this is wrong, and other people go no, this is how it was. It's supposed to be. It's always been like this. Oh, I grew up in a really political home. I think we had a very strong conscience about the the absolute tragedy of what South Africa did and 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 presented. It was fundamentally, <clears throat> morally, completely wrong. And so I always found it kind of funny moving to England where nobody really talks about politics at all. You know, I grew up chewing politics at every single meal. And you, you, you were not friendly with people who had different politics to you because it was so moral. It was a deeply moral issue. So if someone thought apartheid was a good thing and that black people were bad and white people were good, to me, that was reprehensible because it wasn't just thinking whether free trade is okay or capitalism is okay. This was deeply, deeply moral. And it still feels, I am still a great protector of things that I believe are morally wrong. Um, and I, and I, I have very strong feelings about that. And, but but your, your conviction, did you think it comes from the dinner table, sitting around having those conversations? Because I think most of us are examples of our childhood in many many ways and certainly in this show we call it connecting our past to build our futures because so much of what we do and we love as adults when people say to me yes I found my path really are closely linked to the things that they did as children when they didn't get paid for it and the fact that you're doing what you're doing now seems to me just a, a sort of larger version of what you were doing when you was a child but those dinner tables conversations night after night after night that must have shaped you Oh, I think it did. I mean, I think my grandfather was in Russia during the revolution. He was head of the International Red Cross, uh, evacuating prisoners uh, during the Russian revolution. Um, so I think my father got it from him, and he was a district surgeon, my grandfather. And, um, and my mother was a, a social worker, and she died about uh, 15 years ago. My mother was a social worker, and so as a little girl... Um, I used to go with her to Soweto um, because she was part of something called the African Self-Help uh, Program. And we used to be taking nutrition and foods into some of the little creches. They used to run creches for children in Soweto. So very, very poor families would send their kids where they'd get a meal every day and they'd be taught in a really, really lovely nursery school. And so as a little girl, I trotted all over, um, you know, with my mum 
around Soweto. And then my father uh, was very, very involved in medicine. He's a doctor. And so he worked in rural areas. So I would be in the car driving into tribal landscapes and being in, in huts, listening to people, having conversations about nutrition. And, and then I studied to become an anthropologist um, at university. And I think it was because I was fascinated by culture and custom. And that was from growing up sitting in mud huts and, 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 and found that. But then again, I'm such a contrasted person because I also grew up loving art and cities, but I am passionate about rural people and landscape and what makes life work for people and the beauty of what their lives are about. And, and uh, yeah, I think I was very, very privileged, very privileged. Fascinating. The, the, the project, what are the kids doing on a daily basis then? So how, how do you structure their day to sort of get the most out of them? Well, sa- sadly, we don't have them every day. And I think that's one of the things I'm working very passionately towards at the moment is I'd really like to create a residential academy um, because I think that we can only touch a certain part of these young people's lives. We see them weekly. So some young people will see more than that, depending on their need. So we're very reflexive, reflex, ref, we're very flexible and very uh, responsive uh, to what the needs are going on in their lives. Um, and we go the extra mile in everything we, we can do. Um, so we see them weekly uh, for an hour or more a week. And then we see them as a group, and that's one-to-one. And then we see them as a group every two weeks to have some kind of social time together. And then we see them monthly, which is a workshop on personal growth and nature. So they'll do something in the outdoors, but it's got a big personal development element to it. Um, and that will be for anything from a year to, to forever, um, because we're still working with graduates who come back when they need us um, or need support or just checking in with us. So um, we, we don't see them enough, um, in my opinion, um, but we've got a structure that keeps a very constant thread in their lives for the times that they're with us. So so is there kind of similarities with the kind of scout movement? Mm, um, it's funny enough, Ian Player, who was our founder, once said, because people will say to me, oh, you're just like Outward Bound, um, which is a big movement for young people in the outdoors. And, and Ian said, no, we're not. We're an inward Outward Bound. And I think that is the difference. I think we are very much around reflection, evaluation, communication, learning to share, looking at values, looking at ethics, growing a person to really understand what makes them tick. Um, I mean, I'm an NLP master practitioner. I'm very interested in what motivates one's behavior and helping people to evaluate their own behavior. You know, what is it serving? Why do I behave like that? What am I getting from it? Because, you know, all behavior has a motivation. So we're very reflective, and I think that makes us different um, because we will sit and talk. We we do a lot of talking and sitting and sharing um, and encouraging people to start to express what they're feeling because a lot of people don't have words to talk about how they're feeling, particularly the young people that we deal with. Their language around emotion and feeling can be very restricted. So did you... Are there key moments when you can see that the penny has dropped with these kids and they're they're in the program and maybe the first few weeks they're finding their feet and they're looking around and I imagine dealing with the kind of children that you're dealing with there is a desire to push back if if, if they've been sort of mistreated or they haven't had the best of times they're they're not going to trust people who are just going to come in and help them so are there moments when you look at it and you go yes I can actually see a crack occurring there. I think this this is going to be okay. I think so. I, I mean, life is an evolving process. And um, what you get at one minute grows into something else in another. So I've become a firm believer in allowing life to unfold. But I'll give you a wonderful example. Um, one of the young lads that I am mentoring at the moment, and I'm not going to give him any kind of naming because he's been struggling, Okay. And he gets himself into trouble 
he sabotages himself a lot. And I said to him on the phone just before I went to Canada, I said, come on now, because you've got to start to step up and help yourself because you can't expect everybody else to help you. And he said, okay, so what you're saying is, oh God, what did he say? It was something like, if you, if, if you, you can help me, if I can help myself, and then you can help me again. It was, I wish I could capture it exactly. It was so beautiful. I sat awestruck on the phone because the way he said it was so beautifully getting it that actually if he can help himself, then it helps me to help him. That's what he said. So if I help myself, then it helps you to help me so I can help myself better. And it just got it. And um, I've just been catching up on how he's been getting on and he's had a great two, 10 days while I've been away, really knuckling down. And that is a penny to me. Um, and sometimes the penny, David, comes in a way that it, that just makes you want to break down. I mean, there was a young lad seven years ago who couldn't make eye contact. You know, he had a hood, hood up all the time. And we went sailing one day and he really messed me around. And I was tired and frustrated and I had to put my glasses on because I was about to burst into tears because I was just so frustrated. And then I came and sat down next to him a little bit afterwards and he, he just patted my knee and he said, I'm sorry. Now, for, for kids who function well, that's not a big deal. For this boy to have an empathy level and to say I'm sorry was such a breakthrough in terms of empathy and connecting human to human and it was really beautiful. So I think we're very zen in the sense that we we take moments of great success and achievement. Um, and that's the breakthrough moments when you think, actually, if you've got empathy, if you read another person, if you're able to articulate it and, and make up for something, et cetera, that, that's, that's really beautiful stuff. You started off the conversation saying that you take a delight in the small things in life. And that hand on the knee, bear in mind it was seven years ago, it was such a small gesture. A, it, it's remained with you, but how powerful is that story? Yeah, it, 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 it will never leave me. And I think it is the tiny things that actually matter. And it's looking for the tiny things that... When we're so ambitious for the big things, we very often miss the small things. And that's what really, they're very powerful, the small things. And I think when you're parenting children, you're so busy looking at the bigger picture of what you want them to gain and achieve and grow towards that you very often miss the, the subtleties that actually are, are, are actually all about meaning, life meaning. And, and that's, that's so, so relevant. When, when I started this job, creating this show, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Hopefully, I'm a lot better than I was at the beginning. But it was just step after step after step. And I look back at some of the shows, and they were good. And some of them, I think, oh, I missed a trick there. But it was absolutely, as you say, it's all the little things that have built up to when you suddenly get momentum. And it's it makes things easier. But we, we come back to tenacity again. If I hadn't have had that tenacity, if I hadn't had that ability to just do the small things, if I hadn't had that desire to provide what I am providing to the world and earn no money off it, and I was doing like 17 hour days for, for nothing, you know, but was it for nothing? It certainly wasn't because ultimately I've created something that I'm hugely proud of. But it is, it's all those small little things that build up, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, you know, dots, Dots can just be dots, okay? It's what you do with the dots. It's what you learn from the dots in, in a way that I think really matters. And that's about life. If one takes time to think and reflect, um, it, it's a huge gift um, because normally, and I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a real pack horse, as, as I've said, but I do think a lot. I do reflect a lot. And I try and learn from myself a lot because I don't get it right um, all the time and in fact you know as a child I had some really painful things that happened that you know really hurt but I said okay so what can I do differently now um, and again you know there's that great NRP saying about you know if you do what you've always done you'll get what you always got and again that's one of my things I 
<laughs> put on everybody. But it's so true, isn't it? You keep doing what you've always done, you're just going to get what you've always got. And if you want things to be different, you have to really think about what you're going to do differently. Um, and it's very powerful when you think that way. Well, well, let's play the words now of Steve Jobs, because not only does he talk about dots in a, a profound way, but he was certainly somebody who, for his whole life, did things differently. So this, this is Steve Jobs. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college. But it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. Now, you've got a lovely big heart. I can, I can hear it in everything that you say. So do those words mean anything to you at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just beautiful, beautifully put. And um, funnily enough, we were looking at doing something around wilderness leadership. And, and I remember writing a piece about being on a trail, a wilderness trail, which we do, which is kind of completely simple, just your pack on your back for five days in the middle of the wild. And I remember saying, you know, there was a buffalo in the path that we were taking to a place where we wanted to sleep once. And uh, we had to walk all the way around this flipping buffalo up a hill and down the other side because it would not budge. And I remember thinking that's what leadership is about. And that's what Steve Jobs has just said, is if you have some idea of it, of who you are, what you want, and then you're willing to divert off the course uh, because there's an obstacle, but you keep going to where it is you want to be. Um, that's a real life lesson. So he says it beautifully, really beautifully. Have, have you found Joe Roberts? Have you found the, found the absolute unique version of yourself? No. I know. I don't think I'll ever be completely satisfied. Um, I think I've always got a quest for learning, and I think um, I'm constantly evolving. Um, I'm com constantly on the lookout for, for new growth. And, and that's what nature does, you know. You have your autumns and you have your springs, and I'm always looking for spring, um, what new shoots will come up. And, but I'm also interested in that strong, that strong branch that grows stronger, but it's pushing out new shoots all the time and growing. I, I'm very much around growth, um, hopefully not expanding waistline, but a, a, an expanding life force. That's, yeah, definitely. I, I asked a question right back in the introduction, and it is, I've been leaving it till sort of the end of the show, really, because I do find that so many people that are doing wonderfully caring things and helping people in the world actually quite often beat themselves up that they're not quite doing as much as they would want in their head. Are, are you similar to that? Do you look at what you're doing and are you totally satisfied or do you think, oh no, if I, only if I could get this residential course going and if I could only do this and if I could only do that? Um, I, I'm very satisfied in some things. I never want to be complacent. So I have a kind of a agitation around complacency because I think that we never know enough. I don't think we ever do things completely but that leaves possibility. And in fact, I'm a great believer in possibility. And I never want to stop believing in possibility. Um, I'm very creative. I've got an over-creative mind. And in fact, you know, our new chairman um, keeps telling me off because, you know, I, I'm constantly seeing new ideas and thinking new things. Um, do I beat myself up? Yes. Do I beat myself up as much as I used to? No. Um, but I always think that it's possible to do it better. Um, and I'm kind of glad about that because I would hate to just, I could never be static. Um, I believe in growth and that is about possibility. And that is always challenging yourself a little bit to say, could I do this better? You know, what have I learned from what we've been doing up till now that helps me realize we could do this differently and therefore do it better. So I, I'm, I'm probably pretty exhausting to be around because I'm kind of interested in, in, in growing and constantly growing. 
Well, why do you think you are like that? And why do you think that all the quote unquote successful people are like that? Because it's a similar theme. But the whole world is full of people who are just going through the motions. They're going to jobs that they don't like just because they feel it's the only job that they're ever going to get. When that's quite obviously not true. And they're in relationships with rubbish boyfriends and girlfriends and stuff and they're unwilling to give it up because they think it's the only person they're ever going to get and it's a kind of limiting mindset why do you think that the successful people keep on pushing forward all the time where so many of the people in the world will just settle with what they've got oh i i think it's because somehow they've got a possibility gene uh, i i do think it is about this um willingness to risk and to try um i don't know what creates it and i think if you know i've talked a lot about if only we could capture the essence of that it would be an amazing thing to capture i think that it's a it's a little bit i think david about stretching someone just that little bit forward and i think that's what we try and do in our work on the leadership side and on the youth at risk side it's about saying just try it you know just take a take a nibble at that biscuit you don't like and see what you think um try life you know and i think people grow up maybe with the messaging not to try um but i believe if you try you can always say actually i've tried it i don't like it uh but people are frightened to try and i think there's a cautiousness about overextending or not liking or being in pain um and to me that's really sad because life is such a rich experience but you've got to try and believe in possibility i think boring I, with that. I, I speak to I, so I, many people who are quite simply bored i say to them how's work then and they go oh it's a job you know that kind of um mentality and i was talking to a chap last night and quite often when i'm having these conversations theories will just burst into my brain and it's kind of like i've never said it before but once it's starting coming out of my mouth i think oh my god i think i think i'm, I'm channeling something here and if this is a new idea and we came up with this theory um last night and i'd be interested in your um your idea on this that when you're at school as kids 90 percent of it is boring and you're just there with uninspired teachers kind of just getting through the day until quarter past three, whatever, that you can go home. And every now and again, you get a teacher who is amazing and they just inspire you. And you're not sure why they inspire you like nobody else, but they just do. And you almost want the whole classroom and the whole school to be filled with this teacher and you can have them time and time and time again. And so we're kind of trained that we have to be bored in life as kids. And then when we go to work, we're getting bored, but we're getting paid to be bored. So we kind of accept it as well. And we never shake up that status quo of going, no, actually, this is wrong. I know I had to do it as a kid, but I don't have to do it as an adult. I can actually ch change my own reality and build my own future. Yeah, I don't think boredom is a bad thing um, in, in certain contexts. And I think that we've got things in life that we just have to do don't we? And I think I hate going to Sainsbury's and shopping. I hate it, hate it, hate it, but you've got to do it. So I think, I'm trying to think carefully with my words here. I think that there are things in life, like going to school and having to sit in a maths class when you hate maths, that you just have to do. And that's, again, one of the things that we would talk a lot about with young people, is there are things you've just got to do, and you've got to stomach it, okay, and get through it. But you need to make sure that there are other things that you build around those tedious things that do bring you meaning and joy and a sense of, um, of happiness. Um, but you can't, have, you can't get away from the fact that sometimes there are the tedious chores that just have to be done. And it's learning to find a way of doing that stuff and managing to cope with it, but also ensuring that you've got meaning elsewhere. And I guess for some people, a job is a job, but they need then to do salsa dancing in the evening or you know, go to the pub with their mates and, and have a really set of really meaningful friendships around it. Life's got to have those elements in it because otherwise, crikey, it's like you know, eating chalk all day. So you kind of got to eat chalk and cherries, I guess. 
but, but I, don't, I don't think it, we're talking well I'm not talking about tedious chores I'm talking about tedious life and more often than not the people that say to me oh it's a job oh it's a job when I say to them well what are you going to do tonight they just go home and they sit on the sofa and they watch a, a movie or whatever and it's the same kind of thing it's almost that that inability to shake themselves up goes into their social life as well and I say to him you know when was the last time you saw so and so oh, I haven't seen him for months and when was the last time you did this so what you're saying is absolutely perfect if you're going to balance it off with stimulating social activities and and sort of activities in the evening then yeah you can stomach it but I'm finding more often than not that doesn't seem to be the case people are just grouping all of it together and are just accepting and I think that is a crime no, I agree with you. I think it terrifies me. I think maybe what motivates me is my terror of that, <laughs> to be honest. I'm very frightened of a grey life. Um, and um, I wonder whether they know anything different and, you know, what 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 could stimulate them to feel something different. And maybe, you know, as, as we've, we've kind of discussed as well, you know, that maybe you need something really big that happens that then shifts your gear because as you say maybe people are just happy to go along in second gear all the time um, and never try out the different speeds because maybe they don't know what it's like or they're frightened of it or they've never been role modeled it or they've never needed to do it and I, I'm, I'm fearful of, of, of that kind of very boring mundane life I, I, that, that would terrify me because I, I think, but I think I would make a very boring job interesting in some way. I think I'm, I'd always create something that would make it more interesting. But that's how I'm made up. Um, but I agree with you. I think it's, it, it's in our opinion, it's a very sad way to live. But for them, maybe they're happy. You know, it's kind of different strokes for different folks. But for me, it terrifies me. Um, I wouldn't want to live like that. I need to have meaning and, and I need to have a sense of purpose and I need to feel that, that I'm living deliberately. There's, there's a great um, philosopher called Henry Thoreau and he talks about um, going into the woods. He says, I went into the woods to live deliberately and then it continues in the quote and something about never to have found, found that I lived but I hadn't lived at all which is exactly what you're saying. It's, a, it's to live life deliberately and to make the most of it. It terrifies me, Joe. It certainly does. So, so the last question, just before I send you back in time on the sermon and mic to have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self, is do you think that everyone should and can have a kick-ass life if they, if they want it? Absolutely. I'm completely besotted with possibility and potential. Each one of us, each one of us has got the potential and the possibility of life to make life meaningful for them and to do something different and to get out and see colour. Um, but it's a choice we make and uh, it's, it's, it is always down to what we decide to do with ourselves, not what life does to us. It's what we do with our lives that really matters. You see, the 16,000 listeners, Joe Roberts says you can have a kick-ass life. So that's what you've got to do. <laughs> Go out and do it now. Right, I'm going to send you back in time now, Joe, and this is the bit that we call the sermon on the mic. And if you could go back in time and have a one-on-one -on -one with yourself, what age, Joe, would you choose and what advice would you give them? Well, we're going to find out because I'm going to play the tune. And when it fades out, you're up. This is the sermon on the mic. <laughs> With the best bit of the show, the sermon on the mic, the sermon on the mic. I, um, I think I'm thinking about a time when I was probably around, I think I must have been around 12, and I was very, very fat. Um, I was a very overweight child um, and got bullied terribly for being fat and so badly wanted to be um, a princess and beautiful and have all the boys fancy me on holiday. And I just remember that real feeling of never being, of not feeling good enough and trying very, very hard to, to be okay. 
Um, and now when I look back, I think I would have said to myself that I was just fine. Um, and that actually what other people think about you is not the most relevant thing in the world. It's what we think about ourselves. Um, and that if one can be true to yourself and value yourself, it then allows you to be truthful to the world and to value the world. Um, but that's a very hard thing when you're young and vulnerable and, and, and wanting the sociability of, of, of social acceptance. But I think I would have been kinder to myself um, and I would have kick-assed my blooming parents to have made sure that I was given more support to lose weight, which they, they eventually did do. Um, but I think I would have said that it's how we value ourselves is more important than about how other people value us. But that's, that's, a, big, that's a big one. Jo, how can our listeners connect with you? Right, well, we've got um, Facebook, uh, the Wilderness Foundation Facebook. Um, we've got um, Wilderness Foundation has a website which has got everything on it, which is www.wildernessfoundation, or one word, .org uk um i'm we've got an info email address but people could contact me directly which is just joe jo at wildernessfoundation.org.uk um and we'd really really love to hear from people uh as i've said we've got a great site here where people can do team building personal development you know phone up for help or discussion on on issues that they they're having with their teenagers or their families or themselves um, and we're here we, we're a very open very um, accepting organization to work with all sorts of people um, and and we love life so hopefully we can share that out joe you've been an absolute delight on the show you're an absolute inspiration to me you are thank you so much for spending time with us today joining up the dots of your life and please come back again when you have more dots to join up because i do believe that by joining up those dots and connecting our pasts is the best way to build our futures joe roberts thank you so much oh thank you David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free, and we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.